fine people and welcome to the Nikhil Hogan Show. My guest today is Professor David Mesquita. He teaches ear training, sight singing, historical sats lere from the Renaissance through to the Romantic era at the Scola Cantorum Basilinius. His research focuses on Spanish music and music theory, as well as improvised counterpoint. Professor Mesquita, welcome to the show. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to have you. And let's begin by talking a little bit about your background. It's a really interesting one, and I'd really love to know how you found your way into your current area of research. Well, um, my beginnings with music were not really very typical. I did not grow up in a musician's family. There were, at the beginning, no instruments at home, and uh, I did begin not so soon. But with around eight years, I started having interests for music, and my parents supported me in that. So I started having uh, solfege lessons in the conservatory and later additionally uh, lessons in, an, uh, in a Kodai academy for children uh, with relative solmization as well. And in this uh, Kodai method, we had a lot of uh, uh, Valencian folk songs that remain for me a very a repertoire to which I have a very deep relationship. In your bio, it mentioned that you learned absolute solfege, which I assume is fixed dough. And yes. then you also mentioned the Kodai method, which is relative solmization, which is movable dough. So how, yes. how does that work then, the two of them together? Uh, well, it, I grew up somehow bilingual. Also with two different <laughs> teachers, I, I learned to manage both at the same time. Yeah. This was, I think, later an advantage when I faced um, the historical solmization in which there are aspects that are not movable at all. So it is, I would say, neither a fully relative nor a fully uh, absolute system. There are limited transpositions and so on. And uh, having dealt with, with both of them was a help for me, I think. I know they might not apply to the Renaissance, but do you have absolute or perfect pitch? No, I don't have. But I would say with, with the time, somehow I developed a bit of it some, uh, as well. I th yeah. if, if I am working on a certain instrument for hours and then uh, I go to a concert, I will hear the music maybe in the pitch of which, in which I have been working. Uh, but I would not say it's a pure, uh, absolute pitch I can switch. Can you um, comment on your training in solfege? Because you teach it. You teach ear training and, and sight singing and these sorts of things. What kind of method were you using for solfege? The, 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 the one in the conservatory? And you mentioned a lot of songs from Valencia. So what was the repertoire and how long were you doing these things? Uh, well, uh, I teach in the Scola Cantorum Basiliensis. No? And the students that we have come from all over the world with lots of different backgrounds. Uh, so lots of them have done a lot of absolute solmization and others have done Kodai and others have done no solmization. And uh, at this moment, when they are adults, it is not maybe the moment to start a musical alphabetization from zero. But I uh, am very, I am not very orthodox about what I do in my lessons. I switch. And when I see certain problems with uh, transpositions and, or other aspects, I use a tool that seems to me appropriate in this moment. Also Arabic numbers and uh, also letting people with uh, absolute background uh, sing in a relative way uh, to force them to mm. somehow uh, yeah, to, to change their, uh, their method. That must be quite challenging, right? I mean, I don't. Yes, I, I was yes. never trained in that, but I can imagine for the friends that I have that do use that, it, it's like changing the way you think about the notes completely. Yes, but it is rather not something that leads you immediately to uh, to success, <laughs> but something rather that uh, lets you notice how uh, different can methods be and what they are useful for, so to, to show them the tools they have. Could you comment on the Kodai method? Because I know that's a very popular method around the world. And how long did you use that method? And what did you take away from it? And could you give your opinion on the method? Well, I was learning with Kodai method for four or five years. And then I was teaching a bit piano in such a Kodai music school as well. Um, but um, for lots of years, I did not do that anymore until I rediscovered historical solmization. Um, I would say that for, especially for children and for learning uh, 
uh, as for learning simple songs and being able to understand that the musical uh, features of a melody are are a, a relative thing. Kodaly uh, method is extremely useful for that. What, what do you think about hexachordal solfeggio? So this is not movable or it's not fixed though, but it's it's precedes that. It's it's one of the older methods of solfeggio where you have this six note hexachord and the mutations. What's your opinion of that method of solmization? Well, uh, we have to understand that these methods were created for a certain uh, in a certain context, and uh, when they were singing rather plain chants or melodies with a small range, uh, solmization inside of a hexachord was very useful, and sometimes they had to do some mutations, and uh, the historical development later with bel canto and so on of having a bigger range in the melodies leads you automatically to more and more mutations, and the mutations become a kind of uh, uh, own problem by themselves. They, they become more problematic. And you can see that in the 18th century, they were dealing and somehow suffering with that. Also, right. there were different ways <laughs> of uh, putting a seventh syllable or of making uh, mutations in strombotic ways to... Um, yeah, there was no single, not just a single method to do that, but it became really very complex. And this explains why at the end, the seventh syllable uh, had more success. And from this moment, with the seventh syllable, uh, the tradition of, solf- of solmization is split into the absolute and the relative. Do you have a preference for all three methods? Uh, personally, for you, if if you had to choose one, and I know that's kind of a silly question, but if you had to choose one, <laughs> <laughs> or, or, and this includes Arabic numbers as well, would you, what, would you, uh, what would you choose? I would say when I, I have children and they learn some song, and I would uh, learn them to, uh, I would teach them to sing do, re, mi, fa, sol, sol, la, 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 sol, the, and, yeah, not reacting to the key as something that can be do, done in any key. The melody is always do re mi fa sol. This melody, and I uh, do this uh, with tonal melodies in relative solmization. But when I work on my students improvising a canon at the fifth, uh, then the one sings ut re mi, and the comes will answer ut re mi in the other hexachord. It is extremely useful to have uh, this identity of syllables despite the answer is at the fifth. I think that we try to use the tool that fits better for our purpose. I know, I'm sorry, I don't uh, decide which is the best method, but um, I'm not orthodox about it. Children today grow up in our music of the 21st century, I would say, in our culture, and they don't sing only Gregorian chants and Renaissance music. So uh, why should we... Uh, uh, forbid to them to use other tools. I'm very interested in how you teach this. So you teach ear training, and let's talk about that. Let's begin with ear training. From what I understand, and I, I only really know a little bit about the Italian method in the Partimento tradition, and, and apparently they sang solfeggio, but they didn't have a class called ear training. Um, but I guess that was, everything was ear training. How do you teach ear training? Do you teach it the, the conservatory way? Do you have your own method? Is it, does it influence by historical practices? Well, I try to have a method, but uh, the different background of my students uh, demands that I react to that, to the situation, and that I have to try different methods depending on the, on the specific problems as well. But um, my approach to historical solfeggi uh, is not just to let them uh, sing them, but also to point out certain patterns that you can find there, certain schemata. Because I think uh, the way I learned solfege, it was just repeating in the conservatory. We repeated and repeated, and uh, then at the end, you know the memory almost by heart. But we were focusing on our melody. Is that good or is that bad? Well, the repeating. Repeating, repeating is necessary for any training, but. Uh, uh, the way we repeated was not very interesting, uh, especially because we were not dealing with accompaniment. I think the teacher sometimes was just not playing. We were singing unisono. 
And in fact, the interesting thing is the relationship of the melody to the accompaniment, or for example, in Bertalotti to the second voice, yeah? when you have uh, solfeggi for two voices, uh, because uh, there you can find so clear contrapuntal patterns. And the children were from the beginning learning these patterns, like with the mother milk. So I think that's something that was very clear for them unconsciously. They learned this in an uh, implicit way, without uh, any kind of explanations. And we come from another musical culture. We learn a bit like a foreign language. We uh, grow up in a yeah, in another context, and uh, need maybe like when we learn a foreign language to uh, get aware of their patterns. So I, I work on them, that they uh, look, for example at imitations, at uh, intervallic progressions, like this movimenti yeah, of, the, of the partimento, and uh, these uh, kind of things. Uh, for example, I let them uh, sing one voice, the half of the class, and the other voice, the, the other class, the other half, sorry, sings the other voice, and then I let them exchange their voices without looking at the paper. So I force them to hear what the others are doing and how it is related to the own voice, and so on. Is it all oral, do you, uh, do, or do you ask them to sight-sing it? I uh, ask them to sight-sing it, but uh, I uh, ask them as well to sing the other voice that they cannot read. Also, for this exercise, it's very useful to give them only their voice. So they get the information about the other voice only by hearing and relating it to the own voice. I would like to point out at this moment, uh, an interesting moment I found in, uh, in this film, in Buena Vista Social Club, in uh, which the school and musicians talk about their lives and their training. And the double bass player, Cachaito, he says, uh, I like to play with Ruben a lot and uh, I think I have very good ears because before he plays the next note, I already hear it. <laughs> and uh, looking at this film, <laughs> that's, I thought, great. that's what ear training should do. Also, of course, we can uh, write down what we have heard, yeah, like a protocol, like we, we have heard that. Okay, great. But uh, in real musical life, we need to understand where music is going to go and what will happen next. And obviously, this possibility to hear in advance what the other one will do depends on the musical language, on, on the typical patterns of the language. And uh, he did not learn that from a teacher, probably. <laughs> he learned that by playing a lot, a lot of son cubano. But uh, I thought, as I was seeing this film, that's what somehow we should try to integrate in our lessons. Can I ask about improvising now, the counterpoint? So... It's one thing to hear it, but when you improvise, you have to have a vocabulary and then it has to come out on the moment. The first question is, where do you get the vocabulary from? Do you use examples historically? Do you have like a, a big book of like thousands of examples? Do you take from the, 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 the choral works and do you also ask them to come up with their own stuff? Well, I think example from the choral works is very important because there is a lot of, I would say, implicit theory inside them, or implicit uh, improvisation models. You can extract them from the repertoire. But uh, I don't ask the students to look at the scores and, and look for them. Yeah. Uh, obviously, you talk about the sources as well. And maybe, as I started teaching Contrapunto Lamente many years ago, I sometimes brought a source, like Guillermo's Monacus, to my class, and we were reading it together and commenting it and trying to understand what, what he's trying to explain us and then try to translate this into our improvisation. But my method has changed quite a lot since then because I realized that um, probably the, the teaching in the Renaissance was not done like this, reading a source from a book. Yep. <laughs> and they, they, they learn from the teacher and the teacher showed them how to do it. Yeah, and about this, maybe if I come back a bit to my background, I had an experience as I was young, because I also learned to play the dulcina, which is a kind of shown, uh, double reed instrument that we play in Valencia. And the, 
the teaching was not academic. The teacher just played, and we had to repeat what he was playing. Sometimes we work without any kind of score. And once you have learned enough tunes, you start playing on the villages, on the fests of, of the villages. And um, the teacher used to play a second voice. But he never explained us how to do it. He played many parallel thirds, but not always. And there seemed to be no fixed rule about that. But, and I, yeah, I liked that when he was doing that. And in certain moments, after you play for some months or for some years, one day the teacher is not there and nobody's playing the second voice. So you jump think, in. <laughs> Here we go. Yeah. <laughs> and you start doing it. Oh, it must take years, right? I mean, years, I would imagine, to really get it into your system. Well, in some examples, it's not really very difficult. But, uh, well, mm, to, to dominate it, maybe, yes. But uh, this experience that seemed to me at that time very amateur, yeah, in the sense that what I learned in the conservatory, the professional way of mu making music was always according to the score. And counterpoint was something with lots of rules <laughs> and lots of, of forbidden uh, things. And uh, I realized that this early experience with the Dolcina, for me, teaching contrapuntal mente is essential now. I started in the last years just doing that. So I give the students a tune, a plain chant, and I let them sing it. And I say, well, I will add a second voice now. And I just do it. And then I ask them, please, who could... Uh, replace me who could do that and maybe they do exactly the same or something similar which can also be very good and once they do that how I long say, okay. uh professor mosquito how long is the example well at the beginning not very long of course uh, but if we work on a written plain chant on a, yeah then it can be somehow longer as well hmm? But the, the interesting thing is once they sing the second voice, I repeat the procedure and I say, well, now I will add a third voice. And they have to hear how I do it and to reflect a bit on the, on the patterns, but not always explicitly. It, I don't need to ask always, well, what intervals are we using? It has a bit of developing the reflex, the, reflex, the, the reaction. Now, if somebody doesn't know anything, uh, like just they don't know anything and they come into your class. And I'm sure you, you must deal with students who are very fresh to singing, perhaps ear training. How do you gently work their skill up? Well, mm, the situation is that the groups are not very homogeneous. But um, in the Scola Cantorum, certainly every student in its bachelor has singing lessons. So when you study there, you have to sing. And that's not something that... Uh, not negotiable. To anybody there. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, exactly. You have to think. And I tend to... Uh, well, the, the advantage of working with many voices is that you can let everybody uh, choose a bit uh, the difficulty level because uh, the person that will sing the second voice will have uh, an easier job than the people adding the fourth. Yeah, And uh, you ask, who wants to sing the second voice? And uh, you, I, I try not to force too much uh, the people to do things in front of the class when they are not ready. But uh, I encourage them to try as much as I can. And uh, maybe the, my experience as choral conductor with amateur people also helps me that I, I think I can, I can bring them to sing even if they are not very confident. I tend to encourage them. And then they see that somebody else is also doing mistakes. And I do mistakes as well. I uh, insist that we, that improvisation is an art of imperfection. By, its, by nature, we have an aesthetic of imperfection. I have evidence of mistakes in, in, uh, that come from improvisation in, in uh, certain uh, compositions. And uh, I say, if we do mistakes, they're historically informed mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> so d don't, uh, don't worry, that's historical. You used a term earlier called contrapunto alla mente. Does that translate to counterpoint for the mind? Well, what does that mean, actually? Yes, it's a counterpoint that you, you do not uh, on the paper, but you do immediately orally. And I think it's very interesting, this distinction... Um, 
a distinction we can find in Lusitano. Because we tend to think today, when we improvise, we have to do the things in a fully um, spontaneous way, with no preparation. And I think that that's not really very historical at all, or that's only a part of the historical practice. Uh, and in Lusitano, I found a section in he, which he's talking about many people improvising together and looking for a cadence. Yeah. And he says, you can do this kind of cadence uh, in a de improviso, he's writing in Spanish, de improviso, or sobrepensado, or en compostura, which means fully improvised, or sobrepensado means thinking. Yeah? after the thinking, or uh, written. Also, he distinguishes three categories. So I think that between the fully spontaneous uh, improvisation and the written one, there is a third category in which we can prepare, we could rehearse, we could uh, find to get, uh, look together for solutions. And the job of the chapel master in Spain in this time was to uh, prepare the counterpoints for the Sunday. This one was one of his jobs. So you, he had to rehearse that. So maybe they added first the second voice, they repeated that until they found it satisfactory, they looked later for a third one, they did changes. So it's a kind of compositional process without paper. That's also one possibility. So that was a Spanish, was it a theorist, a teacher from the, the Renaissance period? Lusitano is a, an interesting figure. He comes from Olivenza, which is in the border between Castle and Portugal. And he later went to Italy. So his first uh, treatise, uh, the big one, is in, uh, in Spanish. And the second one is uh, much shorter, but it was a print in Italian. So we have a very international figure there. <laughs> but I would say that it is, uh, with certain differences, it's happening in Portugal, it's happening in Aragon, and it's happening in Castel, also only in the Iberian Peninsula. I uh, really enjoyed your articles where you talked about I mean, I'm very interested in Spain overall because I really love to to read about the Spanish Golden Age, the Siglo de Oro, right, uh, with the 16th and 17th century. And unbelievable, very fabulous musicians, great uh, mastery of, of music. And there was some, you wrote of the polemics of the people in that period of the 18th century, who there were some disagreements, discussions. They were talking about the Spanish style, and they were also talking about foreign influences, like the Italians and the Flemish and the Dutch and other th interesting things. So maybe we should start with the Spanish Golden Age. And is that where we base a lot of the theory for Renaissance counterpoint from, for your research? Well, um, I... Uh... Research, again, my dissertation has focused on the later treatises, around 1700, and uh, because I thought that they are less known. In fact, uh, when we talked about the Spanish music, people tend to think about uh, Guerrero, Victoria, and the people of the 16th century. And in this time, we can find great treatises, and people have an awareness of that, I think, as about Cabezón, uh, through Santa Maria, let's say, and Bermudo, and... Uh, a montaños, and, and that's different, treatises. right? I mean, it's different from the Italian style. Is, is that fair to say? Well, I would say in the 16th century, the differences are not extremely significant about the counterpoint teaching, I think. Also, I, I would not say that the Renaissance, there are, of course, differences. We know that in the uh, Capella Sistina in the, in the, in the Vatican, uh, there was 50% of Spanish singers at that time, and that they could not sing together with the Italian because they had a very different style somehow, or they improvised in a different way. Uh, so there might have been some difference, but I think that the Renaissance is uh, a quite international um, language in which uh, musicians exchanged their, you, you know, Victoria and, and Guerrero, they published, and Morales, they published their works in, in Rome. And the Spanish were singing Palestrina as well. And it seems that in the 17th century, the, there are great innovations from 
from Italy that don't arrive to Spain. So the Sp Spanish uh, musicians continue developing further the Renaissance style. I think that there is a much bigger difference in the 17th century between the Spanish and Italian style. Like, like I call it a kind of long durée of the uh, Renaissance. Right. <laughs> and further, the, which is not exactly the Renaissance anymore. It develops further, but it, it is absolutely different from what Italians are, and Germans through shoots and so on are doing. Would you be able to give a, just a brief stylistic, could you note the stylistic differences? Yes. Well, um, in any case, there's a very clear preference for a, a vocal style. Uh, there is uh, a preference for polychorality. They continue using uh, music for two or three choirs or four until the 18th century, a lot. It, this is the standard. It's rare to find music for four voices only. Wow. Uh, and <laughs> Yeah, rather rare. Yeah? And uh, this is the normal thing in a Spanish cathedral. So in this church style, the uh, heritage of the Renaissance is very big. And the composition rules uh, remain very close to Stile Antico. Uh, and uh, Valls explains this as well, uh, Francisco Valls, the, the theorist, um, saying that the Spanish have their own rules that the master transmits to the pupils. And each master has somehow slightly different rules. But uh, I have look, found in lots of treatises of the 18th century, explanations or about the hierarchy of the voices. So if you want to compose with eight voices, the typical voice leading rules we know from um, basso continuo are not enough. This explains <laughs> how to lead four voices, wow. what to do with the other four. And, and it's extremely hierarchical. Actually, what they call the graduación de las voces is a theory on what is the typical movement of the fifth voice, of the sixth, and of the seventh, Etc. Depending on the movement of the bass, that's very advanced. It really, an own, like an own culture, and I was wondering, but I did not find these kind of things in Italy so late. The only thing I found is in the 16th century that could be similar. So I guess the the, the writers in the 19th century, like Soriano, Fuertes, all of that was that just because they were quite nationalistic in their writing. You commented at the end of your article. You said. It'd be great to look at all this research without all of that nationalistic prejudices and to just look at it and to, to, to really discern the, the, the unique qualities of, of this particular style. Well, I think Spanish musicology has uh, started doing that very clearly in the last uh, decades. But, uh, well, in the time of Soriano Fuertes, we have to say that also uh, the German or the Flemish uh, musicologist all of them were nationalistic. Everyone. All of them were trying <laughs> to, to show that their school is yeah. the best one. Every, every so country was Fuertes, nationalistic, right, in the 19th century. <laughs> exactly. They, they all do that. And, the, and uh, until the Second World War, probably. And uh, the difference in Spain is that during the Franco dictatorship, they continued doing the same. Mostly. And uh, just after the, yeah, from the 80s, so since 40 years, people have started doing other things, the younger people. And uh, this is likely changing. But um, maybe one problem in, in Spain remains that the musicology, which is in the universities, is very far away normally, with some exception, from what uh, practical musicians in the conservatories do. And that's what it's really a uh, lack in, in, in Basel to be able to work so close, uh, connecting uh, practice and uh, musicological knowledge. This Spanish style, did it go extinct? Because as an example, the Parlamento tradition went extinct. Did this also go extinct in, in Spain and is it being revived or did it, does it still exist? Do people still teach this in Spain? No, not anymore. Well, what happened in the 18th century is that the Italian influence became bigger and bigger, leading to these polemics I talk in my article. And uh, it came partly from Aragon, as the crown of Aragon in the, in the east, was much more in contact with Italian music, because Naples was uh, 
a part of, of the crown of Aragon, yeah? and uh, they introduced that earlier. And additionally, uh, in the court in Madrid, uh, when uh, there was an Italian uh, queen, Isabel de Farnese, she wanted to have opera, and they brought violinists to the court, and they started uh, making, uh, yeah, introducing the Italian style, these Italian musicians, but also Spanish musicians uh, learned that very quickly. Also, they had another tradition, but they had really compositional technique enough, composers like Torres or Nebra, to do great music that kind of use all the spectrum be between the Spanish and the Italian style. I, I can only recommend to, to uh, approach this music by people like Nebra or, or Torres. It's fascinating. You actually teach also all the way up to the Romantic. I guess the question I guess everyone would have is, if you get really good at Renaissance counterpoint, can that apply to your understanding of uh, tonal music uh, in forward generations? I think, of course. Also, it's, it's like learning Latin will help you understand, uh, uh, understand uh, French or Italian. And uh, the same, also the romantic music is very different, but in the origins of this music, we have the voice leading principles from the Renaissance and from the Basso Continuo. And it is, I, I like prefer to focus on the common things. That's what you learn from the, from an oral culture as well, not focusing on uh, certain fashions that a certain uh, time brings, a way to do a cadence or things like this, that can be very specific, but also to look at the master lines of, of this musical language that remain somehow constant. What Can you give some examples? What, what things would remain constant among the different eras? Well, I remember my teacher, Marcus Jans, talking about this when he explained what he called the PIP principle. He called it, or in German it sounds like PIP princip. Uh, it begins, the music begins with a perfect consonant, continues with an imperfect consonant, and ends again with a perfect consonant. And this principle, uh, he, as he said, you can follow it from macho to mala. <laughs> cool. And, and, and that's um, obviously with differences. Yeah? What is a perfect sound in macho is different from mala. Yeah? Just the, the perfect consonant is only... And later in basso continuo, the, the root chord as the perfect one and the sixth chord as the imperfect one and so on. There are uh, obviously lots of cha gradual changes, but there is a, a huge continuity at the end, I think. I'm so interested in the commonality of tonal music and in the sense that, yeah, you know, there are different eras, but... But I, I really feel if, if you know your, your, if you're such a musical person, it seems like you can just jump into any style and at least have something interesting to say. Well, um, I think that composers of different times, for example, uh, Bach was studying Palestrina and could uh, do something with his language and could imitate his style or report Palestrina's music. And Mendelssohn was studying Bach. Um, I remember some years ago with my vocal ensemble, I did a program beginning in the time of uh, Banchois and looking at his compositions, then at uh, Okegem, who was his pupil, and at Josca, who was the pupil of Okegem, and so on, until Bach. And you find there, yeah, the style changes, obviously, but gradually, lots of things they learn from the ma uh, master continue. I think in such a program, you can hear really this, this line. But of course, we hear the innovations. I think the point is, we have heard a music history uh, that is, yeah, we deal with some kind of uh, drawers. We have the drawer of the Renaissance, and it seems that 1600 music changes fully uh, with uh, Monteverdi and the Seconda Pratica and so on, and the Baroque starts. And then the classical era is something fully different. But uh, there are lots of things that don't change in such a spectacular way. And, uh, for example, researching the Spanish uh, music of the 17th century shows you that we can go from the 16th to the 18th without such a break, with more continuous, with more continuity. 
Well, that's rather... Uh, uh, we can see both, of course. I'm not saying that uh, the music is always the same, yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. Of course. But I, I'm just saying that uh, the focus of music history on on the detail and on the uh, radical changes at certain moments uh, should at least be, be uh, uh, compensated by looking at the things that remain constant as well. Can you talk about the different levels of ear training and sight singing and, and co- improvised counterpoint? So there's the beginning levels, the kind of things you would work on there. And then what's at the end? Are you guys singing fugues or something like that? Well, uh, this is a big <laughs> question for me, a big challenge in my lessons, because we try to do two things. We try to uh, go from the Renaissance to the Romantic era to cover all of these periods and to develop the skills from the easiest to the most difficult things. And that's not easy to combine. Yeah. And so we remain at the end somehow a bit amateurs in all of these things. <laughs> because uh, if you would focus more on Bach, then you will not have the time to uh, study Contrapunto la Mente, for example. But uh, there is a tradition in the Scola of that as well. So, uh, Hans Peter Weber, who was teaching for 40 years in the Schola, uh, most of them of his years, ear training, he developed uh, uh, how can I say a structure of the studies in six uh, in six uh, levels, uh, from the easiest to the most difficult, and we try to put the people at the level that they need, and so according to. Uh, to the abilities as well. What what are the levels then? So there's six levels. Could you briefly describe what each level entails? Well, I would say level A, we deal with uh, one voice dictations, with two voice dictations, uh, which don't contain too many difficult jams. And we start relating the melody to the bass. Uh, and I don't deal so much with uh, chordal structures yet. Yeah. But I introduce them. And in a level B, they will work much more on how the middle voices fill in that. And uh, in level C, the examples will be a bit more difficult about the same thing and so on. Also, we try to um, let the people uh, begin at the level that they can, that uh, it's not too easy for them and not too, too difficult. That's something very different from uh, from Satzlehre, from from a subject which has more to do with with knowledge, in the sense that you can have people of different levels somehow, in the same. According to my experience, in ear training, if they uh, if that's too easy or too difficult for them, then you don't have a chance. So, do you also teach counterpoint, or is it is is improvised counterpoint a separate class? Well, I teach uh, contrapunto, la mente, yeah, improvised counterpoint. I, I was normally, you said at the beginning, I, I, I teach Historische Satzlehre. Uh, the point is, I did that for one year for a substitution. But normally I am, also since I went to Schola, I, I specialized on, on the year training and Contrapunto la Mente. So I, I teach Contrapunto through the singing and not through the writing normally. I think one topic that has really become really interesting is this separation between counterpoint and harmony. And a lot of listeners are know about there's this dichotomy between the the vertical uh, Roman numerals and harmonic functions, and then there's also a more horizontal contrapuntal thinking. I, I'm not sure it's so black and white like that, but what's your opinion on harmony versus counterpoint? Are they two separate subjects? Are they the same subject? I'd love to get your your take on this. Well, I think the tradition of harmony lehre is that of uh, somehow rationalizing the polyphony in a sense that you can reduce the harmonic functions to few chords, to few basic chords. It's a tradition that uh, comes somehow from Rameau, but that especially in the 19th century led to to lots and lots of different harmony lehren. And uh, somebody who was a guest in your show, Ludwig Holtmeier, has written very clearly about that. And uh, while well, counterpoint Today, people have the impression counterpoint is something for a very advanced level. So let's say harmony teaches you 
f begins with relatively clear chords and everybody understands what is a tonic and a dominant and counterpoint is for experts. And my uh, uh, approach is very different. So when, once you have two voices, you have already counterpoint. And counterpoint is much more fundamental. Yeah. And if you approach this like I do with the Dolcina, like in oral culture, just add a second voice, counterpoint is not an extremely difficult thing. And in fact, um, well, I would like to comment that I'm writing a book about ear training together with Florian Vogt. And in this book, we to take a structure in three parts, beginning with melody, with all uh, elements uh, involving uh, hearing melodies and singing melodies, uh, about the pitches, the rhythms, and so on. The second part of the book deals with counterpoint. It is not contrapunto elemente exactly, but it is rather focusing on the 18th century. And the third part about harmony, uh, from the background of the counterpoint, uh, lets you find out what the middle voices add to these two voice frame, to this Außenstimmensatz, what you say in German is the, the outer voices as the frame. Well, it's an approach you probably know from, from Gerding and so on. Yeah? Uh, how the middle voices fill in this two voice counterpoint. So that's for me, uh, at the end, once you have me uh, music for many voices, counterpoint and harmony are two sides of the same metal. Is harmony and counterpoint, are they, are we starting to see them kind of merge in some way? Well, the point is if we are merging them now or if they originated and not as two different, so different things. I think the concept of harmony is much more modern. The concept of harmony in the, in the, in the sense of the studying of the chords. Well, when you go to the Romantic period, you take your method, and uh, do you find any difficulty in applying your, your process to later Romantic uh, music, or do you find it fits like a glove? Um, well, obviously, you cannot use just the same tools at all. Yeah? You have to adapt, because I, well, I was emphasizing the common things, but there are differences. But for this, for the Romantic, I... Uh, depart from uh, Förster a lot. Uh, when you work with Förster with his uh, Rome, uh, with Arabic numbers for the, for the scale degrees, and you approach um, Brahms from this approach, there is almost anything that you cannot explain or, or understand from this perspective. But I, I would also like to comment that in certain moments, I do also artificial things like there is there are canons by Brahms uh, in which, uh, for example, the soprano begins, the alto follows a fourth lower, and then the tenor follows another fourth lower, and so on. And I have been doing these pieces in my lessons with no score. Yes, with uh, one person singing the original soprano, one person has the, sc the score, and the others have to follow like in contrapunto la mente. Uh, and uh, so the tools, once you have a canon, for, especially for ear training, it can be very useful to let the people uh, do it uh, from what they hear and not only analyzing the score. So you, you can see, uh, the point is that Brahms as well was studying the old counterpoint and was uh, sending exercises to, uh, to Joachim per letter that they had to solve uh, each other. They were exchanging this kind of of Renaissance-like exercises. <laughs> so uh, th there is a connection as well. Very quick question about temperament. Do you have a particular temperament for each era? Do you, is it like mean, quarter mean tone or equal temperament? Or, or do you have a preference for this? Yes, uh, I would say we come from the future. <laughs> we grew up, <laughs> we grew up with uh, equal temperament in 12. Uh, yeah? And um uh, that's no problem to anybody normally. And when we want to go deeper into Renaissance music, we have to uh, learn the mean tone temperament, especially. I think that's what uh, I do first normally. That, uh, I, Is I, that the, difficult? The, it sounds intimidating. Well, we, luckily we have in Basel all the tools to do this in a subliminal way. <laughs> also, I can ask the tuners to... Uh, put a certain temperament into my instrument, into the spinetti in my classroom, 
So uh, from the beginning, I accompany them with one quart of Minton and they get used to it. Uh, and I point out, I explain a bit of the reasons for that, but not so much at all, because we have other people in the Scola teaching, uh, for, specifically for for uh, tunings like Johannes Keller. Yeah? And we have an Archie organo with 31 keys per octave there. And also uh, Archie Cembalo, we can uh, go into such instruments and play uh, and hear the difference between G sharp and A flat. And when I offer a seminar on chromatics, we experiment with these instruments and we try to sync Lasso, Prophetia, Sibilarum with these tunings. We, it's a part of your training. We cannot uh, consider pitch to be the same as today. Do you have uh, a particular uh, hertz that you choose uh, for, for, your, uh, for your A? A particular uh, frequency? Yeah. Well, we have instruments in 415, in 414, 465, in 430, in 512. And we have uh, different, and historically, we had also instruments with 390 and so on. So it is. It can be hard in the scholar for absolute people with absolute pitch at the beginning. I had also examples of some students with which suffered at the beginning. Uh, yeah. But at the end, uh, sometimes they have to manage that. A violinist plays uh, this week a uh, Corelli in, in 390 with a baroque violinist has to deal with that. They make the recording with the historical tuning, and next week he will record Haydn in 430. And uh, they have to adapt. Yeah. If you are playing in 415 or 430 or different tunings a lot, do you get a physical feeling that you know that, that you're in a different temperament? You can feel the color, so to speak? Um, this, could, this could be a bit individual. This could, I think after my experience with my students and with my, myself, that all of us have somehow a uh, certain... Uh, relative uh, feeling about tuning and a certain uh, absolute feeling that can be in a different proportion. And depending on context and the situations, uh, well, some people feel the absolute very strong and they will be very sensitive to another pitch. And in others, the relative is stronger. I think nobody is purely absolute or relative. But well, there are tendencies. Yeah? And I think there are also studies about the the way the brains work in an absolute here and a relative one. So, but I am not a specialist for that. Do you go to a keyboard that's an equal temperament and do you feel it's out of tune? No, I feel it's a good keyboard for playing, let's say, for playing Brahms. I, I can play a Teufelsmühle, certain chord progressions, which imply... Uh, uh, the equivalence of A sharp and, and, and B flat, for example. And if I would play these chord progressions with uh, Milton, they would sound wrong. And I think diminished seventh chords sound not sound quite bad in, in, uh, in Milton temperament, for example. So it, it, it depends on the static. And I think for, for me, the biggest secret about that is also what happened from the Middle Age to the Renaissance. Because the Pythagorean tuning was great for playing uh, perfect fifths and to use the thirds and sixths as uh, rather as dissonances. And in which moment the third becomes really a consonance and they uh, tune it uh, better. I think that's not just a moment, that's a very long process. Because the, the, how this, the clang aesthetic, the aesthetic of what is a beautiful sound is changing through history. This demands you another temperament. Can you talk about contrapunto.ch? It's a yes. website that you and Professor Florian vote. It's a FHNW project, Singing Upon the Notebook, where you yes. have special tools to practice improvised counterpoint. Yes, that's, uh, we are very lucky about that. Let's say uh, one and a half years ago, our uh, Hochschule, also the Fachhochschule Nordwest Schweiz, to which the scholar belongs, uh, wanted to go to, yeah, to make progresses in the digitalization and uh, they offered financial possibilities for such projects. And we, well, I have to say, I, I work in a very analogic way and very 
how can I say, close to historical tools. So I'm not uh, necessarily a friend of computers for making music. But I thought, what could we do with that? And uh, well, we live in the 21st century at the end. Uh, if I was a child uh, 400 years ago in a Spanish cathedral, I would have lessons in Contrapunto la Mente every day in a small group of uh, six boys with a chapel master. We practice a lot every day. Today, we cannot have that. We cannot have one hour per day since age, since seven, seven years. My students are older, have uh, not so much lessons and cannot practice that much so early. Uh, but in the modern life, computer can be a help because they don't meet every day to practice together, the students. So everybody has a computer, and I thought this could be additional to the lessons, a way to practice that uh, consists of uh, videos that are played by, the, by a player containing a plain chant and a hand that makes a tactus so you can follow it properly. And you can sing a, a counterpoint to it. You can sing a second voice. But this player can also record at the same time your counterpoint. And you can later hear it, control it. You can save it, send the link to your uh, recording to the teacher, or erase it, dismiss it, do whatever you like with it. And you can also play it again and add a third voice. So we dreamed of that uh, kind of tool one and a half years ago. And uh, thanks to the finalization of the FHNV, it was possible to do it. Uh, and we were almost ready as uh, the coronavirus came. That's something that we, we uh, had a lot of luck in this uh, unlucky situation because I could teach Contrapunto Elemente uh, uh, online this semester thanks to this tool. How do you use it? Can other people use it outside of the university? Yes, it's, it's, if you put there contrapunto.ch in your browser, you will, well, if possible on Chrome, it works better on Chrome, then uh, you, can, uh, you can use it. There is, uh, well, it's not really finished the whole, there will be tutorials for different techniques of Contrapunto La Mente that we have to create. One of them is already there, the others will follow. So I, I click the tutorial the, the, section, right? Yeah. And then you, if you click, for example, Contrapunto Suelto, it is the one that is already uh, online. And you find some explanations about the way to, to do this practice, uh, linked to some examples and to some uh, I see it as great. exercises, it's very exercises big. you could use. Plenty of uh, examples. It's wonderful. Um, but and it's in German, you, right? Yes. Is, do, is there an now, English yes. version <laughs> or should we just put it through Google Translate? Well, the architecture of the website is done in a way that we could add later uh, an English version. Okay, cool. <laughs> we, we would like to do it. That sounds great. But at this moment, we have a priority first to, to finish the tutorials in German and so on. So we're wrapping up. So I want to ask some big questions to end, which is what's the best way to learn counterpoint? It's a big question, but uh, maybe we could take a big answer for that. Well, I really believe it's Contrapunto la Mente. It's uh, the approach in which you think something and you immediately hear it. It is not a dry exercise on the paper avoiding rules, but it is something that you will immediately understand how it sounds and that will activate much more of your, uh, how can I say, much more of your abilities. And this is more than two voices. It's, it's multiple voices, right? Well, there are, are uh, traditions of two voices and traditions of more voices. But obviously, this is something you can do a bit with contrapunto.ch, but at the end, you have to do with other people together. And, and if possible, with, with a master. So that you can understand how far this goes. Um, when, when I have many students in the classroom, I have to leave them at the same time. And I don't have enough hands to show them how to do that. But in the Spanish Renaissance, they uh, showed to the students the voices with the Guidonian hand. And to become a maestro de capilla, a chapel master, a part of the examination was that you have to, uh, to sing one voice 
Also, somebody will sing the voice that is written. And in the exercise, you have to sing a second voice, show a third voice with your left hand, and show a fourth voice with your fourth hand to other people that will read them and sing them. So it's extremely hard. But after I found that in so many sources, it is clear for me that they did that. And honestly, it is also hard to play an etude by Chopin. As they, but they practiced and they were able to do it. So uh, that, that's the, the utopy. But I think to arrive to this is possible only if you practice singing and not if you write it on the paper. I feel like there are not that many teachers that we can find that do this practical method of counterpoint. Do you have any recommendations for resources or, uh, I mean, this website, contrapunto.ch, I'll put the link in the description, really excellent website. Are there more resources that you tell your students to check out online or any teachers that maybe if they can't go to the Scola Cantorum, do you, is there any other way that you can access teachers or, or materials? Well, there are others. Uh, luckily, it, it is now a, a topic that has been uh, is, is being done in lots of music schools uh, and and uh, musicologists like uh, Philippe Cambriem or uh, Giuseppe Fiorentino have researched a lot on, on that. And we have people uh, in Genève like Niels Berenson teaching contrapuntal element as well, or uh, Martin Erhard. And, uh, or in Freiburg, they have contrapuntal element as well with Hans Ertz. There are people, uh, there are resources online like uh, the, the webpage of Philippe Cambriem that contains uh, lots of links to all the sources. There are lots of, of, of materials on that. But obviously, uh, the experience is, is not extremely long. Maybe since 10 or 20 years, we, we have been working deeper on that. And it is uh, there are things that 10 years ago I could not believe that are possible. And now the thing I tell you with the hands. Now I have students that are able to do it. So that's for me the most, what fascinates me from this topic is that uh, we can improve really our abilities. I think now playing the piano, playing Chopin, it is very difficult to do something clearly better than what exists now. We are at the limit of the possibilities. And with Contrapunto La Mente, we are like beginning now. Wow, that's exciting. That's really exciting. And I guess the final question deals with the topic of creative music education. And we are talking about it already with uh, Contrapunto La Mente. But if you could reform music education and now knowing the perspectives that you know how would you improve music education that we get it more practical more improvisation more composition but also of a high quality of counterpoint and a high quality of of taste uh, i think you have uh, a lot of experience with that as well if i, I see you are a song beer at music school uh, you are not just teaching uh, the to play an instrument, but also dealing with schemata. And uh, I would uh, add that uh, learning for or from oral cultures as well. Also, the the way of learning, like I did with Adult China, or like, for example, Ken Zuckerman makes with modern improvisation, departing from the Indian tradition, in which the teacher just plays and the pupil uh, plays back. Uh, this, that cannot be the only thing for, for, for a complete uh, musical education, but this has to complement the, the written things. It cannot be like it happened to me that I went to the piano lessons and uh, I had always to play only what is written. And I did not like that. And I was sitting at the piano at home. I was not doing my job properly, but I was improvising chord progressions. And my piano teachers were not happy about that. And I never became a kind of pianist like they expected. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not saying that you should do like me, but I think this time I spent uh, improvising on the piano as a child was not a waste of time. But we, we have to, I, I see me now when my son is uh, playing on the piano what he should not do, that sometimes I tell him, no, do your homework. And, and sometimes I think, no, let, let him do it. And so uh, we, we have to, uh, to be more open to improvisation, to oral ways of making music, and to 
maybe to a much broader, not specialized music uh, culture, a broad spectrum, including uh, music from different cultures as well, and from as much uh, centuries as possible. Uh, to uh, that then is much more than is today the typical thing. I, I just actually had one more question that just came to mind, which is, um, Professor Mesquita, what what mysteries are there in counterpoint with regard to the Spanish research that surprised you, and are there any more I- mysteries that you're curious about and how they taught music? Uh, well, mysteries. Yes, there are lots of mysteries. The nature of dealing with an oral practice will remain there. That we, I have no recording of what they did, and I will always uh, yeah, have the desire to know better what they did. I cannot. And the musicology is today a discipline that depends so much on the written things, and I was suffering uh, that. I spent many years uh, of my dissertation trying to prove that they were actually improvising this or that way. And today I would not um, spend so much time on that. (laughs) There's research very good on that. And uh, in any case, we will never know exactly. But what is uh, an evidence is that they improvised improvised a lot. And uh, to try to to make this possible again, I, I would say if I, I, what the result of my dissertation is not that I know exactly what they did, which is okay. I have spent so many years and I still don't know what they did, but I have uh, lots of information. What what could have been the methods? And I try to apply these methods today in teaching and to produce similar things. As I think, in fact. Uh, I can achieve with my students that we improvise in a way that is similar to the musical examples of these treatises. And and this is a proof for me that it was possible. As if we can improvise it today this way, this means that they were able to do it for me. It's a, a, an empiric an empiric research. You guys are doing a fabulous job, a wonderful job. I, I wish I could be there in your class taking lessons and improvising counterpoint because it seems so exciting. And and I think really what's happening now is so exciting in the last couple of decades, particularly the last 10 years, I think. Everyone is, is, is you guys are trailblazing. And the, uh, I, it sounds like a really fun class. It sounds like you actually get make music and improvise music. And that's why I was so interested to talk to you. I'm sure people are going to be very curious about your dissertation. When is it going to be published? And also, where can people find more of your work and how can they contact you? Well, the dissertation is finished, but uh, the doctoral process is not closed yet. And coronavirus has delayed it a bit. But I, we should close it this year, as I hope that uh, my dissertation can appear this or next year. And uh, about the rest of my work, I'm not uh, very well organized about that, putting that on, on academia, but I should do it soon, I think, the articles I sent you, because if not, they, you have to look for them in libraries. Um, but the point is that my work is not so much written in the sense that uh, at the end, I... I focus on uh, the practical side of it with my students and have not written so many articles on that. So I would encourage everybody of you to try to improvise Contrapunto Lamente, to use the website, to look at other materials I have not mentioned, like uh, Barna Bejanant's book, Chantal sur le Livre, for example, and to try to, um, to do it. And maybe, well, the 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 publications that will appear, like my dissertation and like the ear training book with Florian Vogt, uh, can be a help later as well. Well, the the excellent Professor David Mesquita. Well, it's been such a pleasure. I really enjoyed talking to you. I learned a lot, especially about the Spanish Golden Age and the, the methods here and your teaching approach. Let's come back on soon and let's keep on this dialogue. I really enjoyed it and it was a real pleasure to talk to you. I hope you had a great time. Thanks. I will yeah, last to mention that my, uh, uh, I don't think that I'm doing such a great thing, but I learned a lot from my teachers 
and for my pupils I learn every day. Mm-hmm. And I want to thank them for the things that I know as well. <laughs> and thank you for this very nice interview. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much. Have a great day. You too. Thanks.